St. Bonaventure Catholic Church in Huntington Beach, California presents Rebuilt and Renewed, bringing the word home. Thanks for listening in to Rebuilt and Renewed. For the next five weeks in our liturgical calendar, we will be hearing from John chapter 6, which is called the Bread of Life Discourse. The Lord will look out upon the many thousands of people hungry and in pity for them will invite those disciples to feed them. And he goes on then to identify himself as the bread of life and then invites all of those present to eat his flesh and drink his blood to become nourishment for eternal life. This month of August, we will share throughout uh, about this mystery of food this mystery of Jesus becoming the bread of life. But it's interesting, we should start first about looking at bread a little bit and looking about what that means. So today we have a wonderful gift, opportunity to speak with Deacon Daniel So. He's coming here hot off the plane from D.C. and just got ordained as a deacon. We call him a baby deacon, actually, but he's only a transitional deacon for a year, and then God willing, we'll be ordained a priest this next year. Well, hopefully June, but we'll see how that goes with the cathedral going. So welcome, Daniel, Deacon Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Father Tim. Deacon, I've known him for, I mean, six years, seven years now? Yeah. Something around that? About seven years, yeah. Deacon Daniel was also the one who emceed my first mass. He was a master of ceremonies to make sure everything went well, and it was a beautiful day, and so I'm very happy to have his friendship and his brotherly support. And so we welcome you today, and just so, you. why don't you introduce yourself, let us know a little bit about who you are, and and uh, maybe what you're doing right now as a deacon. Sure, my name is, yeah, so I'm Daniel, Deacon Daniel. Um, I was born in Torrance, raised in Orange County in a little city called La Palma, also known as the heart of Orange County. <laughs> it's a very um, little city. But I grew up going to a small Korean center, Korean Catholic center called Korean Martyrs in Westminster. Um, so for the longest time, my perspective of the church was through this Korean center, um, with Irish missionary priests who spoke Korean. And I was always intrigued by these white men who spoke perfect Korean. It was like, perfect. I've been there. (laughs) And, and I, and I would always imagine like, how do these guys do it? Like, I, I, my dad was the youth minister when I was growing up and I remember getting a tour of the rectory and thinking to myself, how did these priests do it? There is no way I could do this and I do not want to do this. So it's just interesting that the Lord has his ways of um, calling. You know? Amen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I just came back from DC, um, visited my spiritual father, Father Albaca. Um, He's in charge of ecumenism and interreligious affairs out there. Holding it down. Holding down the fort. Holding on the fort. Nice. Well, I'm happy that you made the sacrifice to come out here after you got off the plane. Oh, no. It's great to be here. Hopefully not too little jet lagged. No, no, no. This is great. Thank you. So tell us, how have you enjoyed being a deacon for the last uh, couple weeks here since you've been ordained? Oh, man. I'll admit it's been been great. The, The grace is real. Um, I'm so grateful for all the prayers from all the parishioners and priests and seminary and friends. It's, I, I really feel it, you know, Mm. um, it's been very powerful. I've had very, um, grace filled moments that I, I would say were providential miracles. Um, and so being able to experience that during this time has been beautiful. Right after ordination, I went on a 10 day trip to Jamaica with my pastor, Father Eugene Lee um, and Father Ben Tran. And uh, yeah, we were with the missionaries of the poor and it was a very real uh, humbling experience. Um, We learned, I I especially learned a lot from serving the residents and in their centers. And so it's, really nice to kickstart my diaconate having gotten that experience. Um, Especially since the diaconate's about service. Is exactly, you know, I think yeah. sometimes we can get caught up in the liturgical roles of being a deacon, but really the, the original intent was to serve at table for those in need, for, for those who are 
poor and suffering. And there's a special, I think, like a special spirituality of the diaconate that comes out when we have those encounters. And yeah. it continues as a priest because we never really, we never give up our diaconate ordination, you know, kind of yeah. gets wrapped up into our, our priestly life. As, as yeah. Servants, yeah, I almost get the sense of like the diaconate or a transitional diaconate as well is like a way to really kickstart the corporal works of mercy, you know, mm. and then it's like, if you can fortify it during this period, then as a priest, you can continue to live it out because it seems like as a priest, we're, we're so focused on making sure we, we celebrate the sacraments well. And, and sometimes that could be a temptation to, to give that to the bishop or, or to the, to the deacons, you know, <laughs> it's like, let the deacons take care of it. But yeah, put them out there, stick them on the street. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, they did a good job doing that, you know? And oh, they, they're really good guys. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we're happy to have you today. And uh, Deacon Daniel has a wonderful um, story for us today. He has a wonderful encounter, something he loves very much. And I heard about it through somebody. I forget who told me about your love. He has a very love for bread, a love for baking bread. And and through his own reflection on it, has has real, realized that the Lord is very much so in the midst of all of that in the natural elements that the Lord has given us and then in the way it's made. And there's a kind of a spirituality behind that kind of a theology of bread making. And, and so I thought what better way as we prepare ourselves to um, go deep with John six, the bread of life discourse to start with those kind of those elements, you know, the matter of that sacrament that the Lord has given us so profoundly. And I myself love cooking. You know, I just got back, actually cooked dinner for my family tonight. And um, there's just something special about being able to sit around a dinner table and feed the people that you love. I think nothing says that I love you more than saying I want your, you to have life. And if we don't eat, we eventually die. And in, and in feeding people, we guarantee that they're going to have life the next day, you know. And I think that's our Lord so much, too, is wanting to feed us with the bread of life, not mm. the bread that kind of perishes and we get hungry again, but the bread that that gives us eternal life in him. And so it's such a cool, rich image. And I love just the idea and the theology of just eating in general. I love eating. It's actually my favorite sport. Oh, I love eating too. People ask me what my favorite sport is. They're expecting like baseball or something. I always say eating, you know, it kind of throws them off a bit, but I think it's uh, <laughs> also, I think super, um, it's super me, you know? Oh yeah, no, I definitely, I hear you on that one. Growing up, I used to do all these like uh, bets with my friends. I'm like, oh, you know, how quick can you eat a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts? Or, Dang. Oh, man. <laughs> but now I've learned to appreciate, you know. Mm. It's not about stuffing your face, but it's good. It's good. And there's such a, a wide variety of expressions of food, too, in our different cultures and things. And the Koreans, the Irish food, the American food, the Vietnamese, all of it. We all have that cultural aspect of oh, it yeah. too that makes it so personal. And there's something like that can bring you home with a smell or a taste or a experience, you know, of something. And I think that's a, it's so powerful. It's a powerful thing. It's also the great equalizer though. We all need to eat. We all have this need, this hunger inside of us that's satisfied through being able to feed ourselves or feeding others with, with the sustenance. So. It's amazing how like the mom can communicate her heart to her children just by the food she she serves at the table, you know? It's crazy. It's crazy. Like no need for words. I know. You know? Huh? It's interesting. I was my dad was never one to say I love you. I've told the people this before and but as I got grew older, I started to recognize that like his love language was feeding people. Like he just came and cooked for the barbecue for our family event a couple of weeks ago and uh, cooked for 200 people and it was delicious and everyone loved it Whoa. and things. And, and that's where he, that's his mode of service too. And even at home and after working all day to come home and cook dinner, you know, something good for the family. As I tell people, we always, that's why we're also around, you know, it's a good, <laughs> it's good food. And uh, but that was the way that he showed his love, you know? Sure. And that's the way that I think a lot of our parents do that, you know, by caring for us, by wanting our life, wanting us to have life giving us life, but also sustaining that life with that gift, you know? So uh, this this idea of bread, this bread is probably the most, one of the most ancient forms of cultivated food uh, in, in all of history. And this is the thing that almost all cultures share is mm -hmm. this need for a, a kind of the staple that has been such a, a providential kind of giver of life throughout, throughout the world. And uh, I know you have an awesome reflection on this. So I want to invite you to 
to share that with us a little bit and we'll have a little bit of back and forth, maybe discussion. And, and I just, I'm looking forward to learning myself and kind of using it this month as we reflect on the spread of life. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll just like to begin by, um, sharing how I first got into baking. Uh, it really began when I was in my first year of seminary, we had a brother at our seminary named Stephen Spencer. He's now a priest for the Oblates of St. Joseph. And um, he used to come to our philosophy classes with fresh French bread with these baguettes. And and he would uh, then bring these sourdough breads and um, cinnamon buns and all sorts of really fresh, hot baked items. And I was always intrigued and very grateful for him doing that. Um, but around our second year of uh, pre-theology, he ended up announcing that he was going to uh, move to a different seminary to the North American College in Rome. But that was a certain tradition or custom that he started that I, I hated to see go. Mm. And I, I asked him if he could teach me how to bake um, the way he does so that I can continue this tradition with my classmates. And so he taught me how to bake a standard French bread. And that basically kind of started this whole trail, this journey of falling in love with baking um, because it began with that as my staple and then wanting to learn about the science behind the art of baking. And then to also learn about the different ingredients, the quality. Um, and then also like the, the commitment mm. to baking because it's not an easy uh, art. Rather, there are many times that you try to bake the same bread and depending on the temperature or like the the, cha the subtle change in volume of ingredients, there can be substantially different products. So um, it's trial and error, but then over time, I, I would definitely say, y yeah, you, you definitely become more and more familiar with the the ingredients, the the product, and eventually, like I'm still, I still feel like sometimes. I'm, I'm on day one, you know, like sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, the bread didn't rise. What did I do? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I realized that the temp is a lot cooler. And so it takes a lot longer for the proofing, uh, this and that. But so anyway, yeah, that's just how I kind of got into it. Um, but right. since then, uh, year after year, I, I, I've kept doing different things for our seminary, bake sales and whatnot and that has led into my discovery and, and my theologizing over time on the art of baking. Nice. Believe it or not, not many people know this, but the the very first thing I wanted to be when I grew up was actually a pastry chef. When really? I first started to think about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's actually a real thing. Uh, I was younger, but like my dad took me like to the um what was it, the uh the Orange County School of the Arts. They have a, a like a kind of a kitchen there. They do have a school, oh, wow. culinary school. So he used to take me there and I have a little chef jacket from there I used to wear. I used to bake a lot. Wow. I used to make a lot of French desserts was my specialty. So, um, and I was actually a lot more comfortable cooking, uh, baking than I was actually cooking like savory foods. Really? I was always afraid of getting someone sick with meat or whatever like that. So, but it was kind of exacting, you know, like baking is a very kind of exacting mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. of uh, art as well, which yeah. I, kinda, I felt comfortable with and kind mm -hmm. of being able to do that. And, and having people enjoy the fruit of the labor too is always like the best part. You exactly. Know? You're like, I yeah. love this dessert. It's like, oh yeah, it's good. Cause it's like butter, cream, eggs, you know? <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> some good flour in there. So awesome. Yeah. I think bread is always in my family. The bread and the butter, you know, it's like that can be a whole meal right there. You know, the staple, the staple right there. You Absolutely, know? I love that. It's yeah, just, it brings me back. Especially my mom loves that hard, hard on the outside, soft in the middle. We just had actually tonight at dinner. We had a nice rosemary loaf from Costco. It was oh. uh, with a right nice. Ooh, mm. if you haven't tried that one? You should try it. It's delicious. Yeah. 
Yeah, when you get that croissant with like the perfect crust and the folds and the flake, you know, and you like break it and your hair go. Ugh. And then it's like you can see it steaming from inside. You're like, wow, I folded it perfectly. Like the butter is just evenly divided in there. And those are not easy to make. Oh, yeah. Fresh, no. fresh puff pastry. <laughs> I've been there, dude. Been there. Good times, though. Yeah, good times. What's your favorite bread? It might be a hard one, I know, but... Ooh, that is hard. I, I Sourdough, for sure. Okay. Yeah. But the type, the type of sourdough, I mean, like, I really enjoy rye. Mm. Um, but, yeah, just a classic sourdough. I just love that that taste you know where where you actually can taste the fermentation it's like oh man when it's done well yeah, it's com it's complex too mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. a, yeah that flavor profile it hits certain taste buds that you can't like get in any other way it's like ooh, it's almost like umami you know what yeah. i mean it's like <laughs> wait what i didn't i had that taste bud like i didn't even know <laughs> and it livens you up when you're like oh dang you oh know? man yeah. I know yeah. Everyone loves good food. That's like the one thing that like is kind of a universal thing is is if it's good, people love it. This isn't good. This it's like nine forty right now at night and it's like I might get hungry again. <laughs> That's all right. We'll okay. We might get some bread afterwards. We can go, we can go to those twenty four hour bakeries, you know, we the donut oh, store yeah. starts uh, you know, fulfillment over there already. So. Oh yeah. Next week, we continue our conversation with Deacon Daniel as he dives into the spiritual dimension of each of the elements that go into making bread, as well as the natural processes that take place, which allow these seemingly inedible objects by themselves to become something that is nourishment for us in our body, and which the Lord takes and is able to make for us nourishment for our soul. Until next time, thanks for listening in to Rebuilt and Renewed, bringing the word home.